So you've now been working together for the better part of a year. You have a pretty granular understanding of each other's businesses. Talk to me a little bit about the key distinctions between Henderson and Janus. What does each firm bring to the table here? Dick, why don't we start with you? Sure. I think the first thing to notice is that Henderson is a terrific, successful name uh, and has great relationships in the UK, in Europe, and had a very good business in Australia. And if you look at the footprint of Janus, we've done very well in the United States, we've done very well in Japan with the help of Daiichi Life, our friend and partner there, and also we had a good foothold uh, through an acquisition in Australia. So if you think about those as the five key markets for organized pools of capital and for therefore businesses like ours, mm -hmm. each of us was pretty strong in about two and a half of those five key markets. Together we're strong in all five. So you've got, you've got the map covered, the globe covered. I wonder though, let's stay on the idea of uh, the UK because Henderson was very strong there and it's based there and the new firm, the new business will be based in London as well. As you've been working on this Janus Henderson integration, of course the British government has been working on Brexit as well. Global banks are moving their staff and their operations out of London, JP Morgan buying a building in Dublin for instance. Some firms might think twice about building a business in London right now. Dick, what are your thoughts on Europe now that you've been so involved Involved in this transaction? Well, I think that we live in a world with a lot of change, and Brexit wasn't something I predicted or foresaw when we started into this uh, conversation and ultimately this, this marriage. But uh, I don't think it's the only potential uh, upset out there. And so we're looking at our business as positioning itself for the future and to be strong enough to withstand surprises and shocks. And certainly Brexit is one of them, mm. but it doesn't change the fundamental truth that the UK and Europe were and will continue to be core uh, markets for the asset management business. They'll be tremendously important. And London has been a global financial center for hundreds of years. And despite Brexit, I, I expect that will continue for a long time in the future. Yeah, and look, look, I agree. I think um, obviously what's happening with, with Brexit, uh, we don't know what the extent will be. And just going to take up, there'll be a lot of uh, ups and downs as we go through negotiation phase. But when you're mentioning earlier about the banks relocating, I think when you look at financial services, it affects different industries differently. And I think the asset management industry is the least affected of financial services through whatever the, the Brexit outcome is. And that's because there are already firms such as Henderson and now Janice Henderson already have Luxembourg and Dublin based fund families that we're able to sell through uh, through the uh, Europe. And that's exactly a similar structure that American firms would have had and utilised prior to that. So at the moment, we have a business that's got this fund managers based in the uh, European country. When Brexit happens, they will be outside the EU, but there are mechanisms that we can run to do that. Do you have a plan B, though, if London continues to lose its stature as a financial centre of the world? Uh, well, at the moment, I think it'd be it'd be uh, too early and too premature to have a plan B. Uh, first, we don't know the the full extent of what a Brexit negotiation is. But and even if London does see some of its services move away to other jurisdictions, I still think London is going to be a very strong financial centre on a global scale. It's just got the ecosystem of the talent pool, the infrastructure around the, the likes of the professional service firms, such as the lawyers and the accountants. It will continue to be one of the leading financial centres. I want to talk a little bit about this uh, co-CEO structure that you guys have set up here. This was billed as a merger of equals. Talk about how you plan to make this co-CEO co relationship work. Is it a temporary structure? Is it a permanent structure? Well, the first thing I think it is a, definitely a situational structure. It's because of the nature of what we're trying to bring together. We've got two very strong businesses with, with uh, a great depth of, of um, culture and heritage and in part of their histories. And to bring those together and to create a single firm, which is what we're seeking to do, does require both of us to work hard to sit there and make sure that the, the organisation comes as one organisation rather than stays as two separate um, businesses, one centred in Denver, one centred in London. Um, to do that, it requires obviously both of us to work collectively together to achieve that. It's not something that uh, most firms have all the time, but mm -hmm. for this situation I think it, it is absolutely necessary. The board is committed to reviewing the situation after the integration phase, which is typically takes up to three years, and we're both comfortable with the fact that that's a decision the board can take if it's not right for the firm at that point the board will make that decision and we're very comfortable in that, in that scenario. And you'll assess then. Well, who's going to be in charge of what, Dick? Well, our highest priority is to make sure that we bring these two uh, companies and cultures together and create the best uh, new company that we can. And because of that, we've chosen not to divide formally our responsibilities uh, between us. 
Obviously, there'll be some rules of convenience about who goes to which meetings, and we'll try not to all do the same thing because the shareholders deserve to have the greater reach that we can have as two CEOs. But we're being careful about not formally creating an Andrew team and a Dick team and then all the, the sort of the complexities of those potential competitions. Um, we very much want to avoid that. So at the start, we're focused on doing things together. Mm -hmm. And then I think over time, we'll work out whether it makes sense to have some more differentiation. But initially, the highest value is making sure we bring everybody together in one team rather than create uh, multiple teams. And bringing everyone together also allows you uh, to scale up properly and, and, and benefit from that. Um, you can obviously take advantage of economies of scale when it comes to compliance and technology. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more specifically about how you plan to utilize the scale to compete against some of your bigger rivals in the asset management industry. Dick? Sure. Uh, clearly, scale enables you to have better financials. It enables you to have a better margin, which allows you to both have better returns for your shareholders, but also to make more appropriate investments in developing your business. And both those things are, are very important to us. So I would say that the, the strongest motivation for this transaction was not scale. It was the complementary nature of our distribution and the complementary nature of our portfolio management, which allowed both groups to get better and stronger put together. The third element is, okay, we need to be as financially efficient as we can be in order to fund both good returns for our investors and also appropriate investment. In that area, the scale really helps. Mm. And so uh, we're, we're, uh, we have promised at least $110 million of synergies. Uh, we're well on our way to delivering that, and uh, we think that will provide great opportunity for our shareholders to benefit with us. And in making sure that you cover the globe and the different asset classes, uh, you're closing or merging some of the underperforming funds. Uh, you're keeping, however, Intech, which is the Janus Quant division that's seen outflows because of lagging performance. With Quant investing taking the asset management industry by storm, I wonder, uh, Andrew, how significant a product is this for you going forward? Look, I think Intech is something that uh, is a capability or an approach to investing that we didn't have at Henderson, and I think it's a real strength of and the diversification that um, uh, that, that Janus brings as part of the Janus Henderson merger. I think um, when you look at Intex track record, you're talking about the very short-term flow picture. They've actually been a very strong source of growth for Janus over the years, and they've got over a 30-year track record in a lot of their strategies and delivered some very good value for the client in that sense. So I do think Intex has a large part to play as as quant equity is an alternative to, to investing and can be done at, uh, at price points that are attractive to certain clients in the way they do that. They can also manage the volatility and the risk uh, very, very well and be able to articulate that well, and which is a, a lot of what people are looking at. They're not just looking at the return side, they're looking at the return uh, judged against risk and, and, and sure. Intech are very good in that regard. I wonder though what you're going to do to improve Intech's fund's performance overall though. Specifically, are you looking to build out more tech capacity on the quant side? No, uh, the first thing to understand about Intech is their uh, investment process is a uh, sort of volatility capture or rebalancing premium capture, which is a bit of a technical set of terms. Mm -hmm. But basically, they sell the stocks that go up and buy more of the stocks that have gone down by, by a significant margin. That basic engine can be applied to all liquid uh, indices and generate some outperformance over those indices. And then they can apply it with different risk parameters and different other things. I think the market for that is strong. I think their approach is strong. Strong. They have really excellent investment professionals. They've been through a tough period, but that happens sometimes in this business. It's not for us to go in and try and revise their investment process. We will spend time trying to support them, trying to ask intelligent questions, trying to troubleshoot with them, trying to make sure that we think that everything that is humanly possible uh, to be done to communicate well with clients, to, to uh, improve our strategies, to invest appropriately. We'll, we'll try and make sure all those things are being done, but it's not for us to go in and really change their investment process. Would you add to that investment process by hiring more people for that division? I think it's an area that when we work with Intech, they, they will look to develop their, they, as they have, have over their 30 years history, as they need resources, like any year part of our business, uh, we'll continue to give them to them. What type of candidates would you be looking to recruit as you integrate your, your separate businesses? Where would you be hiring? I don't know that we have a, a complete list to unveil right <laughs> right now. What would you say, Andrew? Yeah, well, I think at the moment, given what we've just created and the fact that the, the merger is just literally completed, mm -hmm. we're very happy with the lineup we have. Uh, you know, as new areas either require greater investments or um, development, we'll do that. But for now, we're actually really pleased with both the product lineup we have as well as the geographical footprint that the combined firms had. 
And part of your product lineup, of course, includes Bill Gross, the rock star fund manager, Dick, who you brought over from PIMCO. How big of an asset is someone like Bill Gross in attracting money now that the company is larger and globally more diverse? Bill is terrific. Bill is probably the best uh, fixed income manager of my lifetime, uh, the number one best fixed income manager out there. Uh, but he's reached a point in his career where he's not looking to run another firm or manage a big department. His focus is on leading his product forward, his global unconstrained bond fund, and making sure those investors get an excellent risk return result. He's done very well. He's attracting positive flows. I think that will continue. And uh, he also brings uh, intellectual uh, life to the firm. He brings the ability to teach clients about what's happening in the market. He brings macro insights. And these are very valuable for us and our investment teams, but they're also extremely valuable for our clients. So he contributes to the whole in a lot of different ways, and we're very lucky to have him. Forgive me for asking the obvious question here, though, but a lot of people had mentioned after you bought Velocity shares back in 2013 that there would be a Bill Gross ETF soon. How come we haven't seen one yet? I think uh, when you talk with Bill about how he wants to allocate his time, he gets to make some choices at this point in his career. And so far, he has not decided that that's how he would like to allocate yeah. his time. And I'll support that. Um, Bill, if you're watching and you want to launch an ETF, give me a call. <laughs> but uh, at this point, we'll let Bill lead us in terms of what he would like to do and how he'd like to allocate his time. All right, Andrew, I want to read you something that KBW's analysts had written about the, the merger, that organic growth will remain anemic, this was the analyst's words, uh, and that near-term earnings would be noisy. I believe you've targeted 2 to 3% organic growth. Is that a characterization that's fair? Um, I, I think in the short term, the noisy bit about the earnings is definitely there because you're taking a, a UK company that was not under US GAAP into US GAAP numbers. You, you're merging it. You've got the, the fact that the you only have five months of the year of just the Henderson numbers and you've got the Janus numbers joining as part of that. So I think the unpicking of the change in accounting standards for half the business and the fact that the businesses have come together halfway through the year creates some of that noise. In terms of the anemic growth, I think that's an unfair characterization. I think in the short term there is obviously disruption as we're bringing the firms together, but we expect that to pass, particularly now that the teams are coming together as one team. Mm. Uh, we've done a lot of work around the product prioritization and product training. Um, and the 2 to 3 percent growth is, is something that we, we genuinely have put this business together because of the strength that it brings in distribution. And that will lead to long-term value for shareholders and stronger growth potential than we would have had on our own. As you both know, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America had warned that second quarter trading would be down by double-digit percentages, I believe at least 10 percent. They blame low volatility for that. I wonder if you're seeing these muted swings in asset prices uh, hurting or helping your net flows. What does it look like so far this quarter, Dick? Uh, I can't give you an intra-quarter uh, flow update. The Securities and Exchange Commission would have a problem with me. But Generally speaking. Generally speaking, I, I think uh, good markets lead to better flows for our industry. Uh, it's been very tough in U.S. large cap space, so it's a bit segment by segment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I think that'll probably continue.